Good afternoon, and welcome to Addressing State Teacher Shortages, the Promise of Apprenticeship Programs. Today's webinar is co-hosted co by the Learning Policy Institute, the Pathways Alliance, the Ed Prep Lab, and the Teacher Licensure Collaborative. We want to thank all of our partners that have made this work possible through these initiatives. Today's conversation builds on the continued interest in finding ways to leverage registered teacher apprenticeships to support paid on-the-job learning for future teachers and support access to high-quality teacher preparation. We hope to focus on the state policy landscape that can both support program quality and continue to expand access for future teachers. As we go along today, please don't hesitate to drop questions into the chat and we'll work to bring them into our discussion. With all of that said, let's jump right in and I'd like to introduce Maureen Tracy Mooney, Senior Advisor, U.S. Department of Education's Office of Planning, Evaluation and Policy Development, who will kick us off with some opening remarks before we hear from my colleague, Hannah Melnick, who will walk us through high-level findings from the recently released Pathways Alliance and LPI Brief, Tennessee's Teacher Apprenticeship Program, Role of State Agencies. And then we'll hear from an amazing panel of leaders in this space. Maureen, I will turn it over, you, over to you to kick us off. Thanks so much, Ryan, and thanks to all of our partners for organizing this today. Thank you to all of you for joining uh, and prioritizing um, this conversation. Um, so as Ryan said, I'm Maureen Tracy Mooney. I'm a senior advisor here in the Office of Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education and have the great honor of helping to lead our department's work on eliminating educator shortages. Um, so it is not breaking news to all of you that uh, the pandemic had a devastating impact on staffing in our schools. In just three months in 2022, we lost 730,000 local public education jobs. That's 9% of all of those jobs. The good news is that as of February, we now have more people working in our public schools than before the pandemic. That's great progress. We have 40% more social workers. 25% more nurses. These are all critical uh, staff that are supporting students and also reducing the load uh, and burden on teachers who take on so many roles. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that our teacher shortages remain, um, both in terms of um, comparing to pre-pandemic numbers of teachers. We also know we have more teachers and uh, emergency certifications, teaching out of certification areas. Uh, it's, as always, when we have these challenges, disproportionately impacting our most vulnerable students disproportionately impacting students of color, students from low-income families, English learners, and students with disabilities. And we know now that local, local school districts and states are also figuring out um, how they can sustain as many investments as possible, including in staffing, um, with the wind down of the American Rescue Plan COVID relief dollars. Um, so we're at a critical moment, uh, and I'm excited that we're having this conversation now about how to really uh, strengthen the pipeline into the profession through the expansion of high quality and affordable educator prep programs. Here, talking about registered apprenticeship programs and teaching. So I thought it would be helpful um, for those of you who, who might be new to this conversation around apprenticeship and teaching to just start out with a ba basic definition of, of what we're talking about when we talk about registered apprenticeship programs. So to be very concrete, uh, these are programs that are rather registered with either the U.S. Department of Labor or a state apprenticeship agency that meet the requirements of a registered apprenticeship program. And some of those key requirements are here. Um, so first, that all apprentices have a paid job, so that student teacher has a paid job and is earning a progressively increasing wage, um, that the registered apprenticeship program has structured on-the-job mentorship from an experienced mentor, that apprentices receive supplemental instruction here, often higher education coursework that builds on their job on the job training. That apprentices are receiving a portable nationally recognized credential, such as a teaching license, and that our programs are designed to meet the needs of individuals in the communities in which they operate and support workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when we're talking about registered apprenticeship programs, that's what we're talking about. Sometimes the term apprenticeship can be used very informally. Um, some residency programs are called apprentice, appre apprenticeships. When we're talking about registered apprenticeship programs in this, in this conversation, that's what we're talking about. And the department is excited about it for a few reasons. What you see here is the department's five key strategies for eliminating educator shortages. And we're excited about registered apprenticeship programs and teaching because they really support several of these strategies. Um, so first, they support high quality and affordable pathways into the profession. We're not able to address our shortages, which existed well before the pandemic, unless we're really able to open up uh, teaching as a profession 
to more people. Right now, it's just too expensive to become a teacher. And, and, and folks, particularly uh, college students of color who are graduating with more debt than their, than their white counterparts are having barriers to entering into the profession. They're doing the math when they're looking at student debt and they're looking at the lack of competitive wages uh, for teachers and just deciding it's not something they can afford. And that's not okay. We need everybody that has a passion for the teaching profession in this profession. Um, and of course, that's why number one strategy is addressing compensation and working conditions. Um, so, so two, it provides really high quality um, new teacher induction once they're into the classroom, um, once they finish their apprenticeship and ongoing professional learning. Um, that includes for those mentor teachers, which in our column four here, are provided career leadership and teacher career advancement and teacher leadership opportunities and opportunities to earn additional pay by becoming a mentor of that apprentice teacher. And finally, it supports your educator diversity strategies. As we've talked about, um, we need to make our pathways into the profession more affordable. And we're seeing so many apprenticeship programs really focus on um, folks like paraprofessionals that have been serving in, in their cl in, in classrooms for years, but couldn't afford to earn a BA, couldn't afford to earn a teaching certification. These registered apprenticeship programs are providing a structured pathway that often eliminates tuition altogether, that allows them to earn a job, earn a benefits while they're working towards a teaching certification. And I would say that's a key difference, Mary, between an internship and an apprenticeship. Internships, sometimes internships are paid, sometimes they're not paid. Often interns aren't um, fully salaried salaried employees, right? Apprentices are employees. Um, they're being paid as an employee. They're an FTE, um, receiving receiving those benefits in, in, in many cases. Um, and this is a, uh, a the, the length of time varies from program to program, but we're, we're not talking about a, a one summer or semester internship, for example. So that's just one, a couple of the reasons why the department is really excited about registered apprenticeship and teaching. Next slide. And as we do this work to expand registered apprenticeship, and I'll talk about uh, that expansion in a moment, we really want to make sure that we're focused on high quality apprenticeship programs aligned to what we know about the evidence for high quality educator preparation programs. So when we think about registered apprenticeship, um, uh, it's a wonderful tool. Tool, but from a program requirements perspective, those requirements I shared earlier are the same across all industries. Um, so there are certain program standard requirements you have to meet to become registered. Um, we don't want uh, apprenticeship programs into teaching just to meet any standards. We want them to meet high quality standards aligned with high quality educator preparation programs. Um, and something that we're so grateful for our Pathways Alliance uh, uh, partners on the call today the Pathways Alliance, which includes a coalition of the really leading organizations you see here on the slide, put together the National Guidelines for Apprenticeship Standards that were approved by the Department of Labor. And what these guidelines are are really a framework that says, OK, as part of your apprenticeship program, you have to submit standards to show that you're meeting the Department of Labor's requirements. If you use these standards here in our national guidelines and use this as a framework for your program, you can be confident that they're aligned to high the evidence behind high quality educator preparation program. So you're not establishing just any old apprenticeship program, but a high quality apprenticeship program aligned what we, with what we know about good educator preparation. Um, so we're, we kind of have a, a, a two track strategy here. We wanna expand registered apprenticeship, and we want to make sure that they're high quality programs. Um, so the department, through its funding, through its through its grants, has been really focused on on two of those on those two things. Next slide, please. And excitingly, what we've seen is since the beginning of the Biden Harris administration, we've gone from zero states with the registered apprenticeship program to now we have thirty five states, D.C. and Puerto Rico that have a registered program in them. Um, and this map we just updated, uh, now Mississippi has a registered program as well. Um, so we're, we'll talk about this a little bit later in the call, but the department is really focused on providing the, the robust technical assistance and support um, to expand these high quality programs because the, we think that they're really pivotal to expanding high quality and affordable pathways into the profession. So we can really strengthen the pipeline to, in the long run. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Ryan. Thank you very much, Maureen. We really appreciate that opening. I'm going to hand it over to my amazing colleague, Hannah Melnick, who's going to give us a research briefing. Hannah? 
Hi, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Mo. Um, so I'm Hannah Melnick. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute. And today I'm going to be sharing findings from a recent policy brief that we put out on how states can support teacher apprenticeship, the case of Tennessee. So I'm going to de briefly describe Tennessee's state apprenticeship model. And then in our panel, we will dive deeper and discuss lessons for other states. So as uh, Maureen explained earlier, the teacher apprenticeships have expanded rapidly in the last few years. And this map um, builds on what Maureen showed earlier. Uh, it's updated in 2020, at the end of 2023, and it shows the extent of the teacher apprenticeships in the, the country. And we can see that most programs are still getting off the ground. So we have light blue states that established a program by the end of last year, but didn't yet have any registered apprenticeships, apprentices. And then we also have the light, darker blue colors that had between one and 100 apprentices registered. There are, however, a handful of states in the darkest blue that had over 100 registered apprentices. And these include Tennessee, Iowa, Missouri, South Carolina, um, and now I believe Nevada as well. So we took a deeper dive into Tennessee um, for several reasons to inform other states that are hoping to expand their apprenticeship programs. First, Tennessee has the most apprentices enrolled and completed. Um, to date, it's had nearly 700 apprentices in or through its program and nearly 200 completers. It's a mature state program having run for about three years and it meets the Pathway Alliance criteria for quality. Finally, Tennessee has, is a state that has really taken a strong role in scaling teacher apprenticeship, which we think has implications for governance structures in other states. The Tennessee Registered Apprenticeship Program actually began in a district in Clarksville Montgomery County School System, which launched its teacher residency program in partnership with Austin P State University, its School of Education, in 2018. And we're joined today by Lisa Barron from Austin P. Uh, the district in Austin P had asked the Tennessee Department of Education for support in registering their program as an apprenticeship because they wanted to access additional funding. And not only did the state agree to act as um, the sponsor, but it also liked the model enough to try to replicate it throughout the state um, through new Grow Your Own Program grants. And the program expand really quickly um, to several EPPs or education preparation programs and districts. So by the time the US Department of Labor had approved Tennessee's application, in January of 2022 and made teaching an apprenticeable occupation, they had already made uh, had several apprentices throughout the state. So because of Tennessee's history um, as a re starting its registered apprenticeship um, as a residency model, it has really similar features to residency. Apprentices work for at least a year in the classroom. They're typically paraprofessionals hired as teacher aides. And in this role, they have a um, mentor who is the teacher of record with whom they might co-plan lessons, design curriculum, or teach in small and whole groups. The mentors need to be licensed. Um, they also have to have at least three years of experience and a strong performance evaluation. So apprentices take on increasing responsibility as they demonstrate competencies on a rubric. The candidate pathways are determined by their school districts in partnership with their education preparation program, but they're based on a candidate's prior experience in prior education. So candidates who have some or no college will be apprentices for at least three years, and in that time they're earning their bachelor's degree and their teacher license. In Clarksville, Montgomery County, the candidates did all of their lower division coursework at community college which is free in Tennessee and really helps with um, saving on costs. Apprentices who have an associate's degree or equivalent are in the class, are apprenticing for at least two years. And those who already have a bachelor's degree apprentice for at least one year. And in some cases, they're also earning a master's degree. So one thing to note, Tennessee uses a competency-based model of apprenticeship as opposed to a time-based model. 
However, candidates still need to complete what um, is considered the equivalent of 2,000 hours of on-the-job training, meaning they're in the classroom quite a bit, of, and that uh, training time includes planning and prep work. So the state of Tennessee has taken a really active role in state uh, apprenticeships, and they have done that through um, grants primarily. The Tennessee Department of Education acts as the sponsor. They provide grants to education preparation providers to incentivize the spread of apprenticeships. Education preparation programs apply for these grants and they partner with LEAs to provide coursework. Um, to get a grant, ed prep providers need to commit to several um, criteria, for example, offering a certain number of on-the-job hours, tailoring their programs to meet candidates' needs, and so on. And local education agencies or districts, in turn, oversee, recruit, and compensate their apprentices. They may work with multiple ed prep providers who offer different pathways um, into a teacher license. And finally, the Tennessee Grow Your Own Center is an organization that was created in 2022 at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, to support the Tennessee Department of Education in running its apprenticeship. And as an intermediary, it supports the state in reviewing grant applications, matching LEAs and ed prep providers, and supporting data collection and so on. Um, Aaron Crisp, the executive director of the center, is here on our panel, and we'll be describing that a little bit more. And finally, a really important part of Tennessee's model is that they have been clear that apprenticeship programs um, should be free to apprentices and not require them to take out loans. So ed prep providers um, have relied on state grants to cover the cost of tuition. The first state grants were covered by ESSER dollars, pandemic relief, and they were up $100,000 per grant. And across the state, this amounted to about $10,000 per apprentice on average. Now, with ESSER funding um, expiring, this Tennessee has had to secure new state funding to replace those dollars. And um, we'll just as we might get into, the per candidate amount is not quite as much any longer. And so student scholarships have, are also going to be really key to covering tuition costs like Pell Grants, GI Grants, and state tuition scholarships. Some ed prep providers have um, negotiated tuition reductions with their deans, and in some, the case of Clarksville Montgomery and other places, unions have helped cover costs such as um, the cost of books. LEAs are mostly funding teacher apprenticeship out of their own district funds, as far as we understand. Apprentice compensation tends to be funded through existing paraprofessional roles or um, money set aside for positions that have remained vacant. There are many apprentices in Tennessee that are general education paraprofessionals in elementary schools. And districts are using federal education funding as well, for example, Title I or IDEA funding. Um, and LEAs may use the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds to cover apprentice salaries. These funds are mostly distributed by local workforce development boards, so it's important for districts to develop a relationship with their local board. So in learning more about Tennessee's story, we've identified the following questions for states and others to consider as they're building apprenticeship systems. And the first is who's gonna act as the program sponsor? So in Tennessee, it has worked to have the, de the Department of Education acting as sponsor to allow the state to put some parameters around program quality um, and make it easier to scale programs statewide. Um, however, there's also benefits to having more local sponsors like LEAs or nonprofits who can be uh, more nimble in their decision-making. There's also the question of what pathways will be prioritized. So programs for candidates who don't yet have a bachelor's degree, as we will probably discuss, can open up a more diverse candidate pool, whereas post-baccalaureate programs um, can be a quicker path to getting candidates into the classroom. There's also the question of how higher education costs will be funded. In Tennessee, state grants were key to find, uh, funding higher ed costs, um, but as ESSER funds expire, Tennessee and other states are having to look for other funding streams. 
How apprentices' compensation will be funded is another key question. Tennessee has relied, as I said, on paraprofessional positions to fund compensation. So states might want to help their LEAs identify roles um, that apprentices can play or see if new roles need to be created. And finally, which key partners need to be engaged? Um, so as our panelists will discuss, partnerships are really critical in making partnership, uh, apprentices, apprenticeships successful. And beyond the core partners we've discussed today, states might need to engage additional partners like unions, community-based organizations, or county offices. So to dig in further to these questions, I um, would like to now introduce our panel. So we will start with Lisa Barron, who is a professor and director of teacher education and partnerships at Austin P State University School of Education. She leads work to develop apprenticeships with local school districts. Uh, Aaron Crisp is the executive director of Tennessee's Grow Your Own Center at the University of Tennessee, which supports registered teacher apprenticeship programs. Um, Cindy Gutierrez is the Director of the Office of Partnerships and Clinical Teacher Education in the University of Denver uh, School of Education. She has led the development of many innovative clinical preparation models, including teacher apprenticeship. And last but not least, uh, Randy Wolf is the Founder and Executive Director of Early Care and Education Pathways to Success. ESEPS is uh, an apprenticeship sponsor and intermediary in early childhood apprenticeship programs in 14 states across the country. Thank you so much for being here to all of you. So Lisa, um, I'd like to start with you to dig in a little bit more to Tennessee's story. As I mentioned, Austin Peay's apprenticeship program started as an, uh, a teacher residency. And I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how apprenticeship and residency overlap. Can you tell us how the residency model has influence the way Austin Peay's apprenticeship is structured? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, so to go back to 2018, it was developed very organically between the district and Austin P to address three persistent challenges for both the district and the university. And those were impact teacher shortages, provide more teachers in high needs areas, especially special education, and provide more diverse teachers. So when we started this program in 2018, it was a true Grow Your Own Teacher Residency Program. And in that, um, some of our non-negotiables non in that first program, were it had, they had to be an accelerated program, three years for a bachelor's. All pathways would include special education as an endorsement area that they would, they would graduate and be licensed in. We had to provide quality mentor teachers for them. Uh, they would receive wrap around support uh, from both the district and uh, the university. They would be hired as teacher assistants in the district with full-time pay and benefits. Their coursework would be offered in a modality and time frame that would be best suited for the uh, teacher residents, which would be in the evening, um, online, hybrid, and in eight-week terms. And um, lastly, it would be absolutely free to the resident. The teacher, I mean, the district and the EPP, the university, split the cost 50-50 for all tuition, textbooks, fee, and assessment cost. Now, that was our teacher residency program that we began. But as we started uh, that work in 2018 and, and by 2020, that Grow Your Own model was adopted across the state of Tennessee, and, and we started getting state funds. It didn't take long for us to realize that we actually were meeting all the criteria for a registered apprenticeship program. And that was, and it includes things that you've already talked about, Hannah, and that is the uh, have a paid job, receive on the job mentorship, receive supplemental instruction, and receive a credential, which of course is the teaching license. So we knew that the model we created would, would fit the apprenticeship program. So our model was submitted to USDOL on the application and, went, and was approved. Um, so I think the distinction between residency and apprenticeship, it, it can be actually the same program. It's if, are you running it as a grow your own or are you applying for those apprenticeship dollars and apprenticeship uh, distinction? And so um, we, we've done both and it just really depends on, you know, what 
funding perhaps you're you're wanting to get yeah thank you so much for that and i think hopefully we'll get a little bit more um later into some of the supports that you offer for your apprentices because i think that is incredible too and helps understand why you have had such high retention um Erin, I'd like to turn to you because we know that not everyone in Tennessee has been working on apprenticeship as long as Austin P. And that's partly why the Tennessee Grow Your Own Center was established a couple of years ago to help scale high quality apprenticeships. Can you tell us what the center does to support teacher apprenticeships across the state and how you support program quality? Absolutely. Um, we definitely couldn't do this work without the wonderful partnership and support of folks like Dr. Barron and, and their work at Austin P has just been foundational. And they've been so open handed to share lessons learned as we've as we've scaled this work across the state. So you all have done such a great job setting up this conversation today. I thought I'd tell a quick story to illustrate the role of an intermediary like the Grow Your Own Center. Um, we have four regional managers on staff here in the center, and each one of those regional managers has responsibility for um, a quarter of the, learn, uh, the LEAs, the school districts in the state. Um, one of our regional managers, Kate, she's been working for a while now with one of our small city LEAs who has never had an apprenticeship program before. They just recently registered their apprenticeship program this spring. And so here we are in May and they're wondering, what can I do? Is there anything I can get done for next fall? Can I get anything ready and up and running to have apprentices in classrooms next fall and be ready to go? So she equipped them with some recruitment materials and intake form that we've developed here in the center. They sent out that email, that intake form and almost overnight had 54 responses from um, classified staff in their school district called Kate back and said, I'm a little overwhelmed. 54 is a lot more than I anticipated. We really only have about 10 to 15 potential spots for apprentices each year. Oh no, what have I done? And she said, this is a great problem to have. Let's look at the data from, from what you see in your intake form to really understand what the entry points might be for these folks, because we know some of them are going to need some community college before they can transition into those four-year EPP programs. She got on the phone with the community college partner and the two EPP partners who are already established for that LEA. Those relationships have already been um, formalized through MOUs, so those partnerships are already in place. She said, is there any way we could pull together an interest meeting in person for these 54 folks who filled out this interest form in the next 10 days? And if you've ever tried to coordinate a meeting with three university leaders plus a school district, um, who has staff, it's pretty challenging, but it seems miraculously that they've done it. So next Thursday afternoon, after the students have gone home, um, those interested candidates are going to stay behind and the community college partner and the two EPP partners are both going to be present to share about their programs and to take next steps with some of those candidates for this coming fall. And to me, that story uh, that Kate told me just a couple of days ago really illustrates a couple of things, uh, the power of an intermediary. Um, that LEA did not have to experience a lot of the trial and error that a lot of school districts go through when they're trying to figure this out. Um, she was able to provide, you know, this is text of an email that you can send out to your classified staff that will pretty clearly outline what this program is all about. She was able to provide a link to an intake form that gives the right information to the EPP partners so that when she calls them and says, hey, do you wanna to come to an interest meeting? They know exactly who they're coming to meet with, what the level of academic background and experience is of the folks they're coming to meet with. Um, it increases our community college and EPP engagement to have an intermediary, and it also increases efficiency. Um, things can just happen a lot more quickly when there are already some tracks laid for those trains to run on. So that's a little bit about what we do in the Grow Your Own Center. Great, thank you so much. I think that's actually a really great point to have um, you follow up on, Randy, because you also run an intermediary at ESEPS. Um, and while registered apprenticeships in K-12 are relatively new and we're figuring out how to support the growth of those apprenticeships, you've been working on apprenticeship in the early childhood space for nearly a decade and supporting programs as both a sponsor and intermediary, now an intermediary with the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, so can you, based on your experience, tell us about what opportunities you see for coordination or collaboration with teacher apprenticeships work happening in ECE and K-12? 
Sure, thank you. So let me very quickly just throw out some statistics so folks have a little bit of an idea of why you included us and wh where the connections are. Um, ECE apprenticeships have, have sort of got off the ground about 10 years ago. So we've been, some of us, particularly Pennsylvania, California, West Virginia, Kentucky, several other states have been the pioneers. At this point, we have about 18,000 apprenticeships, registered apprentices across the 18,000 apprentices, not apprenticeships, um, across the country in somewhere between 35 and 42 states, depending who you ask and how you count. Um, so, and, but in, and, and ESEPs has been, like Hannah said, sort of a national leader around building the field and not just the focus of the programs we're actually working with. So we have this national perspective, both in California, where we do a lot of our one-on-one -on -one work, but also increasingly across the country. So an answer, specific answer to um, Hannah, to your question, it seems to me as I've been tracking pretty closely the work around K-12 apprenticeships, pre-K to 12 apprenticeships, two things occurred to me. One is we know that the ECE workforce, generally speaking, is much more diverse than the K-12 workforce. And it's well documented. And we can also analyze why that's the case. We also know it is a key goal both of the K-12 systems across the country and specifically of the Department of Labor Registered Apprenticeship System to really look at diversity statistics and inclusion and accessibility. And so one of the things that occurs to me is that we need to think about this moment as an amazing opportunity to build bridges between the ECE workforce and the ECE system and the K-12 workforce and the K-12 system. And I would sort of underscore four groups Four sort of four pipelines we could be building. Somebody said earlier, I forget who said it, we need to think of apprenticeships as part of a way to build pipelines into the profession. And what I would say is we need to think of what already exists as one of those major pipelines. So for example, there are lots of programs across the country that are set up to prepare early educators to work in the community-based uh, early childhood system. There's also a whole bunch of Head Start apprenticeships. There are also an increasing number of in-school pre-K programs, um, you know, that are actually part of the K-12 system already. Those folks earn some kind of an industry credential by the end of the apprenticeship. That's the deal. That's the requirement. But there's something called stackable apprenticeships, which is somebody can stay in an ECE apprenticeship for a year, two years, three years, come out with, in California, a teaching, uh, a child development permit. In a lot of states, it'd be a child development associate. In some states, it might be an AA degree, whatever the thing is. When they finish that apprenticeship, they can then start another apprenticeship. And it's not considered double dipping. They're in, from the DOL's point of view, they're a new person. So if I finish my ECE apprenticeship and I've spent two or three years in the field and I've learned about you know, working with children zero to five or zero to eight, then I could, if we create pipelines and seamless pathways, I could then go straight, if my goal was to become a second grade teacher or whatever age group, then I would go into my local school district's teacher apprenticeship. And the advantage to the school district is number one, we've already done the outreach. We've already worked with them. We've already gotten them over all those initial humps. They're ready for that kind of a leap. So that's one. The set, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make it very brief because we don't have time. I know that there'll be more questions when I'm done than when I started, but that's the nature of a webinar. The second population are the folks in what is now called expanded learning, which used to be called, you know, after school. That pop, we have um, a registered apprenticeships for expanded learning workers. That population tends to be young and extremely diverse. And most, you don't usually take a job in expanded learning as a career goal. It's sort of a career move. While you're in college, you're going to work in an after school program. So when they're done in our program, they end up with an AA degree. Again, this would be a great way to then bridge into, let's say, the final two years of a BA and teacher certification. Because the expanded learning folks in particular, most of them have their eye on K-12. Most of them are not thinking they're going to go into Head Start. That'd be the second group. And then the third is, there's this new thing called youth apprenticeships, which again, we won't get into, but it's where you're excuse me, training 11th and 12th graders Again, they come out of high school with some kind of an entry-level certification, 
and they'd be primed. And we could, again, we could work together in the communities to build these, these um, pathways and pipelines. And the last piece is somebody mentioned pre-apprenticeship or paraprofessionals. We have a registered apprenticeship right now with Oakland Unified School District here in California, where we are training existing paraprofessionals to be able to become teachers in their pre-K classrooms. So all of this exists. And I'm what I'm saying today is contact us. Let's talk. Let's figure out how we can help your efforts and you can build with us because in addition to the good it will do for the workforce, it will also help us with this bigger goal we've always had of breaking down the silos between ECE and K-12. Thanks, Thanks, Randy. And I'm so glad you're making those connections between early childhood and K-12 because it really should be at one continuum. Um, Cindy, I would love to turn now to you to your work um, in Colorado um, to look at the context in another state. You've been working with Denver metro area districts for over a decade to build flexible pathways into the teaching profession. And recently, as part of your engagement with Ed Prep Lab, CU Denver hosted a site visit with your partners at St. Brian's School District in Longmont and highlighted how they started a registered apprenticeship. So can you tell us a little bit about that work and what enabled you to so quickly turn that program into a registered apprenticeship? Sure, you know, I think very similar to, to Lisa's story um, at Austin P. we've had an incredible history of partnership clinically centered driven teacher preparation for nearly three decades now, for over 30 years. We have one of the longest standing professional development school models in the country where collectively with our school district partners, we're constantly co-constructing what does it mean to meet the workforce needs and how do we, how do we prepare teachers really well together. And so that long, long history um, has really helped us continue to try to stay at the forefront of constantly developing pathways that are the right fit for the right person at the right time. And this notion of growing your own, um, it makes a big difference. And, and how you think about growing your own can look a lot of different ways. And it's even, even evolved for us um, over the 10 years. But I'll start with our story about NextGen. Um, NextGen started with us in, about 10 years ago with Denver Public Schools as a TQP uh, grant effort, and it really was a grow your own effort because the district was very much saying, we really want to figure out and crack this nut on how do we grow this incredibly diverse K-12 population we serve into our future educators. And so what we did is we sat down and said, well, let's really think about all of the barriers that those first generation diverse students who have this inkling of like, oh, I think I'd love to become a teacher. What, what are all the things that get in the way for them? And so we really launched the first of its kind over a decade ago of a four year undergraduate job embedded residency model for those students. And it really came about in a way that those students all got hired on in our partner schools as part-time paid paraprofessionals um, because those schools had a hard time actually attracting enough paraprofessionals. They had open positions all the time. Um, the students in their senior year, once they're done in those first three years as a part-time paid paraprofessional, and again, they're simultaneously taking coursework that had already been designed over the, our 30 years of curriculum as a, a place that, that everything is clinically centered. So you're, what you're learning in the university coursework immediately gets applied in the context of schools. Um, and so those positions worked beautifully for that. And then their senior year, they transitioned into a paid residency model. Um, so that's where they took it up that higher notch, right? And they're really doing a lot more co-planning, co-teaching with those um, uh, mentor teachers uh, and, and all of those pieces. Um, and so I think as we really started doing that, uh, we started to also figure out where could we keep innovating on a variety of spaces in the model. One of the things that really developed closely with our, our partners in St. Vrain was this, this concurrent youth grow your own model. So concurrent enrollment is huge in Colorado. Uh, that's a way that the state really tries to support um, reducing the costs for uh, families to go to college. And so with St. Vrain, we have developed um, about a 36 credit hour 
model of concurrent enrollment with them where high school students get to start education courses when they're freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and they get that hands-on experience. And then what we did is then next gen also then came into the district that once they graduated as those high school students, they could move right into these, these paid apprenticeship roles. Um, and the district is able to um, kind of have a general ed uh, apprenticeship position in the first year or two, then they move into special ed, uh, higher tiered uh, paraprofessional position, and then as that paid resident. So I think, you know, our deep history of partnership with the district, our constant commitment to co-construction um, with our district partners, and constantly thinking outside the box, and already being mindful of having a curriculum that is very competency-based, um, and, and constantly takes what they're learning in the classroom and applies it in that context. Those paid positions for those students, it makes a huge difference. So they've had their first graduates um, that were done in three years because they got you know, 36 credit hours done out of uh, while they were in high school. And then they had three years left and now they are hired back in the district and teaching. That's amazing. Thank you. And there's so many parallels between what you all are doing. So the thread of making sure the course pathways are very thoughtfully laid out so that you can maximize um, the candidate's time and make it more cost effective for them. The partnership piece um, and also just the layering of what we've learned over many years in teacher education. This doesn't have to be something completely new. And Lisa, I thought that was some partnerships or something that have also really come up for you. And I thought maybe you could speak to that because we have a lot of people on um, this call who are, you know, just getting started with their partnerships. You are muted still. Um, Dr. Chandler, the Dean of our college and I, we are, travel the country um, literally uh, consulting with other universities and districts about apprenticeships. And one of the, uh, I guess, things we have to address early on is that it seems everybody wants to jump into the apprenticeship train without first establishing those strong relationships and partnerships. And they're missing a huge link in the chain when they do that. And, and so we always emphasize the importance of time, transparency, and trust when we're talking with partners. Um, it, the communication, we cannot overdo communication that takes time with emails, face-to-face -face meetings. The transparency is sharing our data with them and being very honest about where we are and they do the same with us and sharing challenges, having those hard, difficult conversations sometimes. But at the end, trusting that we all want the best for the apprentices and we want the best for the K-12 students. And, and having that tight relationship and partnership allows us to do this work, which some days is difficult work, and, and allows us to not only stay true and have the integrity of the program stay true, but also expand and uh, scale it across the state. And um, we, one of the questions we sometimes get, and it's related to partnerships, is how do you get district buy-in? And that question in itself always bothers me because the question assumes that the program is owned by the university and we are trying to get buy-in from the district to join us at our program, when that's never, ever the case. It's always um, co-constructed, like Cindy was talking about. It's co-constructed, co-developed, and it's completely based on their needs. So what one district wants and needs and can support and has the capacity for, one district won't be able to do that. And so sometimes it's just like Cindy said, I, I couldn't agree more. It's looking at maybe they want to start high school students and get those pre-apprenticeship uh, hours in. Maybe they want to do a three-year um, bachelor's program. Maybe they want to do a one-year post-bac program. Um, and maybe instead of having 40 apprentices, they can only afford to support one or two. Okay, then we can buy, combine those one or two with other one or two in other districts and, and develop a cohort that way. So it's not a matter of getting the districts to buy in. It's a matter of talking to them and having the relationship that we can develop, co-develop the program 
to suit their needs. And I think that's the beauty of the apprenticeship program is that there are several um, components to it that are, you know, we would say non-negotiable, right? But within those components, it really gives a lot of flexibility to build the program to best suit the needs of the district and, um, and the university. And of course, the apprentices and the K-12 students. So it, it's all just a wonderful partnership. And, and so that's what we try to convey when we're talking to people. Thank you, Lisa. And I think this is actually a great time to come to the Q&A. Um, we've had some really good questions in the um, chat from participants. And I'd like to invite um, Maureen back too to be part of this Q&A. So one of the things that was asked was, what specific policy measures do you believe are most critical to ensure implementation and scalability of these programs across diverse school districts, particularly in underserved and rural areas? And I think this points to what you were saying, Lisa, that their districts might be in really different places, but they want to engage and might need different supports. So, Maureen, um, can you, given your experience across states, take the first shot at this question? Yeah, sure. I think a couple of things. First, funding. Apprenticeships are not a, a, a free program. They're not a program where, oh, once you're registered, the wheel of funding flows and all our problems are solved. That, that is, we're not, uh, apprenticeship is not a panacea, right? Um, and if you're paying your uh, student teachers for the first time, because now they're in these full-time roles as apprentices, that costs money, right? Um, so investment is really important. I think we're seeing states like Tennessee, like Iowa, like Nevada, that are really um, investing in these programs and understanding their value um, to be um, ha having the greatest success and the greatest growth. And I think that's because they recognize that this is not a a new challenge, right? This is not educator shortages are not a, a post pandemic phenomenon, and addressing it in the long term really takes uh, requires rethinking um, who our our current system is excluding and how that impacts our students. And the affordability barriers to becoming a teacher are real, and the only way to to solve that challenge is to invest and to make it more affordable. The costs don't disappear just because it's an apprenticeship. So that's sort of leadership, and I think also a, a clear vision for for quality, um, and making it clear that this is not a um, meant to be a, a, a zero runway pipeline. Right? Um, there's lots of alternative cert programs that. You, you can um, support and expand if your focus is on, okay, we're going to do a summer of prep and then get somebody into the classroom. Um, that's not what this program is focused on. Um, so at the department, we really like to see states leading the way when it comes to, for example, making sure that apprentice really has that, that full year or whatever is required to meet the certification where they're getting that active support from a mentor teacher. Um, apprentices shouldn't be the teacher of record. Um, that's what we're focused on when we look at high quality programs from the department's viewpoint. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I, the only other, can I throw one thing in? I think clear leadership from the state level or, or from, from mayors even bringing together those key partners at the beginning, because if it's just the SEA or the LEA sort of going on its own to a, a local workforce board and there's there's not that uh, buy-in from the leadership that manages all those systems, it's more difficult, right? Um, so having the leadership of, of our governor or mayor or county commissioner that is in a position where they're um, engaging with all those folks, I think can also be really helpful. And in general, a, a key lesson learned here um, that Lisa, I think you, you raised up when you were talking about partnerships, starting the conversation with local and regional workforce boards early at the beginning of the process. Those are the folks that control those workforce funds, right? So you want them a part of the conversation. Their funding has not increased exponentially, right? They're still trying to, to support all, all the programs that they want to support. So building those relationships, that trust, so they understand why this is important and the role that they can play um, is really pivotal. Yeah. Great. So, Cindy, how let's think about Colorado. How have the policy conditions evolved there since you um, began implementing apprenticeships? And what lessons does Colorado offer to other states that are working to support programs like CU Denver? 
Yeah, so it's it's a uh, kind of a shifting context right now. We when we registered our apprenticeship um, with uh, Saint Brain, it was purely through the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, we did not yet have a state apprenticeship office, and that's uh, that new office has come into being. And there's been some state legislation that uh, passed last year um, uh, that is a little bit more complex in the way that they are interpreting <laughs> uh, what uh, apprenticeships can be. Um, I think we're uh, continually trying to uh, help shape how that rolls out. Um, there's some new guidelines that are that are just coming out and and to provide us some maximum flexibility based on what a district partner might need in a tiny little rural town, you know, three hours from Denver versus what something like Denver Public Schools or St. Brain might need. And I think that is part of the challenging policy context for Colorado as they're trying to meet both of those, those really critical um, shortage areas right now. Uh, and what that, you know, who, who you can attract in a, a school district that's, uh, you know, got a population of a thousand people in the, in the town is very different than what you can do in, in, in the cities of Denver. So Absolutely. So I'd like to turn to Randy and Aaron to help think about some of this, how uh, intermediaries can be supports and really working with this diversity of districts. And we have a question, um, how are states investing in and supporting intermediaries to help build teacher registered apprenticeships? What is working and where are there gaps? And Randy, I know that you've had several lessons learned over the years. So, so yeah, thank you. I want to show it wasn't muted. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. So first, let me just say a couple quick things in response to some of the things that have been said. I think it was Lisa that said, you know, this work, this is hard work some days. I think it's much more accurate to say this is very hard work every day. And people need to understand, someone else, else said, this is not a panacea. It's not simple. This is not the new professional system that's coming down the pipe. It is a whole system that has to be learned. It's a Department of Labor system. So I only say that not to discourage folks, but they you have to stop thinking this is quick and easy. This, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. The second thing sort of related to that is WIOA funding, very difficult to access. And part of the reason is it's set up to serve individually unemployed people. We, including K-12, including EC, we work with programs, we work with groups, and there's a misalignment. And the DOL knows that, they just haven't dealt with it. So again, I wouldn't want people to think, oh, no problem, we can fund it with workforce development funds. If you can, you should write a paper about that because everybody would be really eager to read it. The other thing I would say is, uh, I forget, I think Lisa also said this, in the world of apprenticeship, it is the employer who runs, who leads. If you don't have employers who need these apprentices, you don't have an apprenticeship. So although the institutions of higher education often take the lead, the program doesn't exist without employers. It's not a, this is one of the things about apprenticeship that's so important. You bring on the job training and higher ed together as equal partners. There's more to say about that, but let me stop there for now. On the question of intermediaries, I don't know many states that have funded intermediaries, so I won't speak to that, but I can tell you what the Department of Labor has done. They have now funded three cohorts over the last, I think, five years or something of national industry intermediaries. So we are one of two national industry intermediaries for ECE. There's also ones for, you know, tech and for healthcare and for solar energy and, you know, other industries. Because the DOL realized they're never going to be able to expand apprenticeships significantly if there's not some entity who's paid by the DOL to go out and just help. When we go to states and say, we can work with you, we can help you design, develop, implement and sustain and you don't have to pay us anything that's what the dol is paying for so that's sort of a critical piece and i think part of the challenge for the k-12 folks is going to be and this is always true there's very few people who know more than much more than everybody else the people in tennessee have what a year or two of experience and they're working hard to keep going they don't really have the leisure to go helping everyone else around the country so it's like a it's a little bit of a conundrum but you can't really learn all this unless somebody can help you at least to get started. So we do things, but it's very focused on ECE. We do these boot camps, these two-day trainings. 
People come in teams. They really learn a lot. They have enough to go on and sort of figure it out. What we've been saying is we're not going to, we're staying on, you know, we have a mission and we stay in our lane. But I would be interested in being able to facilitate some of this in partnership with some of the K-12 folks, because there is something to be able to bring 10 years of experience in the field, even though it's ECE and not K-12. There's so, we have so much more in common than we do with the construction workers or the, even the tech workers, right? And to, and to maximize that. Absolutely. Thank you, Randy. Um, Aaron, can you also speak to what are some of your lessons learned in terms of supporting intermediaries? And we also had a question about what is the retention of apprentices? And I think it, you've had some amazing retention in Tennessee that you could speak to. Yeah, so far statewide, we're at about 88% retention rate um, in the apprenticeship program statewide, inclusive of 11 colleges and universities across 77 different school districts. Um, uh, across all of our apprentices. So we're pretty thrilled about that. And that's really due to the hard work of our district and EPP partners who are providing all of the necessary supports for those uh, adult learners to continue to persist in their programs every day. Um, some of the lessons learned right out of the gate were that we have um, a lot of state eyes looking at us. We are a state funded intermediary in the Grow Your Own Center. And so folks wanna know what's being done with this investment in the Grow Your Own Center. Um, and so we knew we needed good, clean, structured data. Um, it's not super like exciting to talk about a lot of time, the fact that we need good, clean data, but we knew that we needed a system right out of the gate where we were defining things in similar ways. So for example, we define four segments of the workforce development pipeline um, in the educator workforce development world. And we kind of track like how many students do we have in this pre-apprenticeship high school space? How many do we have in the zero to 60 credit hour community college space? How many in the uh, bachelor's completion segment of the pipeline? And how many in that post-baccalaureate um, section of the pipeline, along with all their demographic information and those, and those kinds of things? And all of the associated data that comes with that. How much is it costing at each EPP? Um, what, what are the financial contributions of the local workforce boards? Um, what are the demographics of these students? Race, ethnicity, veteran status, disability, age. All of those pieces of data wanted, needed to be collected and reported back to several organizations and agencies so that quality could be monitored so that resources could be funneled into the right places and so that we could um, leverage the right kinds of grants and funding streams in order for the, the program to continue and um, folks to be served well. Thank you. That's, I mean, we have such a wealth of knowledge here. So I wanna um, thank all of our, you so much for the information and the resources that you've already created and we've been putting in the chat. Really appreciate your time. Um, that is all the time we have for today. I want to also thank our co-sponsors, the Pathways Alliance and Prep Lab and the Teacher Licensure Collaborative and all of those who are here in the audience and giving your time today. It's really heartening to see the outpouring of interest folks have in building a diverse and better prepared workforce by expanding access to paid and high quality teacher prep and on the job learning. We hope you've learned some things about Tennessee's model you didn't know, and this sparked some ideas for you. We have shared so many resources in the chat. Many of these are going to be shared in a follow-up email, as long, along with the slides and the brief, which will be on our website. So please do fill out, uh, take a moment, fill out the survey, which will inform our upcoming events and make them more relevant to you um, and help us figure out next avenues for research. Really appreciate all of your time and have a wonderful day.